my name is Abhishek Pandey. I work in Generali, Switzerland, in the technical architecture group. And my experience with Kamunda is pretty limited. So I started using Kamunda in March of this year. I see a couple of my teachers here. I see Nico there. I see Matos here and Ingo here. So if this talk goes well, it just shows how good Kamunda is, that somebody can learn it within six months and give a talk. If it doesn't go so well, uh, yeah. I'll make a few jokes later on. <laughs> OK, so uh, this is going to be a technical talk. I'm actually going to try and show you running code. Again, I think there should be a box of tomatoes here in case something goes wrong, which you can throw at me. But let's see how it goes. So just to set expectations, it's going to be a more technical than business-oriented. And as a true newbie, I've got a Kamunda workflow diagram as the agenda where I would ask you to ignore the part about asking questions at any time, because when I timed my talk, I was way over 30 minutes. So please excuse that. Otherwise, I would give a background as to where we use Kamunda, uh, what are the challenges we face because of certain constraints and decisions we made, and how we use features in Kamunda itself to solve this problem. So we didn't write a line or a piece of custom code. It's everything which is there in Kamunda. So a little bit about my company. Uh, we are headquartered in two locations, basically. One is in Zurich, and the other is near on the shores of Lake Geneva. Some more numbers related to the company, but rather than dwell on these, I'll talk a little bit about my work there. So I work in the technical architecture group there, where we are responsible for developing and operating software applications as well as the infrastructure. So as part of that, uh, we have developed what is called, what we call the connection platform. It's a streaming data platform built on Kafka, which, uh, which combines our backend systems with the front-end channels. The microservices which run there are normally Spring Boot applications when they're written in Java. Uh, the whole thing runs on Docker containers, and it is orchestrated using OpenShift. So there are multiple Docker containers running on pods, and it's all orchestrated uh, on Kubernetes pods, and it's all orchestrated using OpenShift. So we call this the connection platform, or COPA for short. Uh, now, this environment has four stages the classic stages of development, so devil, test, acceptance in the prod environments. We are fairly relaxed about what gets deployed by whom on devil and test, but there are more stringent requirements for deploying applications and microservices on acceptance and prod. So when we built this platform, our governance team came to us and said, yeah, great, you have a powerful platform, but how do you control who deploys what and when here? How do we know it is tested? How, we, how do we know it's compliant? So we turned the table and we said, OK, the ball is in your court. Please tell us how is it done today. And the answer was, yeah, for this existing application, refer to this Word document. For the other, you have to ask that person. And for the third one, nobody knows. So we said, great. Uh, either we can follow this process, or let's actually live the process of deploying our applications onto this environment. Let's formalize it. Let's execute it. Let's make it transparent, uh, auditable, and repeatable. And that's where Kamunda comes into the picture. So we use it for maybe a slightly atypical use case, which is for deploying our microservices and our applications onto the COPA acceptance environment and the COPA production environments, as well as restricting access to production data. So there were certain constraints which were placed on us and certain decisions which we made, which we thought painted us into a corner. I won't go into why these constraints were placed right now in the interest of time. So what were they? One was that the Kamunda processes are hosted on the connection platform itself. So what this means is we are, we, are, we are coming up with a process to deploy microservices on the COPA acceptance and prod environments, but the Kamunda infrastructure also runs on COPA as well. 
What this means is it's running in Kubernetes pods. Then the second one was the reuse of existing paradigms and patterns. As I mentioned, our microservices are Spring Boot applications. Kamunda comes with a Spring Boot starter, so this was a very good match. So instead of having one pod where we run uh, Tomcat and there's one war file for the Kamunda web app and another war file for the acceptance, deploy to acceptance process, and a third one for the deploy to production process, each one lives in its own pod, its own VM, and therefore runs in its own process. It runs in its own embedded Tomcat container. And then came this third criteria, which was the need to have a central task list. So what this means is a user who is logging into the Kamunda task list, we don't have a separate UI. We use the Kamunda task list. He should see any tasks allocated to him regardless of whether they belong to one process or the other process or a third process. So we don't want a task list pro, uh, per process. Now, Kamunda uses a relational database in the background uh, where all the process definitions are stored and the state of the process, and that's where the task list also gets its tasks from. And this means that all these processes have to talk to the same central DB. So now I will use maybe the deploy to production process together with the web app to illustrate what is the problem we faced. So the process definition is deployed onto the database, the Kamunda database here. However, the source code, so the service classes, uh, the listeners, the Java source code, as well as our UI classes, our UI components, which are HTML files, because we use embedded forms in JavaScript, they are all present in this pod and running in this process. The user logs in to the web app, which is running in its own VM, and tries to start a process instance. So maybe he tries to start this. And here we are using an embedded form whose source code is lying here. And he sees an error like this. That's because uh, the thread running here is trying to find the HTML file, but it's not present. Maybe we could get around this by using the out-of-the-box forms which come with Kamunda. But then we hit another problem. As the process proceeds further, and the user submits the task, uh, it will try to perform the service task here, again, through the thread running in the Kamunda web app. And you get something like a class not found exception. Because again, the class is present in a different process completely. So this was the problem we faced. And we've solved this using mechanisms present completely within Kamunda. So this is absolutely zero custom code. Uh, I will try to show code to illustrate how we solve this problem. But as a high-level overview, this problem occurs because of synchronous execution, which is happening in the Kamunda web app, which is the trigger for all processing. So what we do is we make it asynchronous. What, what does this mean? In the process definition itself, we specify points in the uh, BPMN diagram where we say, OK, this process has asynchronous continuation. What this means is when the process engine hits such a stage, it creates an entry in the job table in the relational database. And we have configured our applications so that there is a job acquisition thread which pulls this database only for jobs belonging to it. So it won't look for jobs belonging to some other process. Once it finds it, it puts it in its job queue, and they are executed by a thread uh, belonging to the job executor. The point to note is that they are all running in this VM or in this process now, where the class files are available. So this solves the problem of the Java classes not being available. There is still the problem of our embedded forms, our HTML forms, and that we solve by using a reverse proxy which says that when the web app gets a request for such and such resource, it should forward it to such and such URL and get the contents. So, so much for the high-level overview. Now I will try the brave part about showing you some code. Uh, if it fails, please bear with me. <laughs> but we'll see how it goes. 
So I have an uh, Ubuntu VM here, which I've set up to simulate our OpenShift environment. I have two Spring Boot applications. The first one is called Web App, which is the simple Komunda Web App, which we are familiar with. You just need to close the, uh, oh. Is it here? Yeah. And then you can bring up Ah, oh, super. Sorry. I didn't notice that you couldn't see this. OK. So in this VM, we have two Spring Boot applications. The first one is the web app, which is the simple task list from Komunda. There's nothing else in the Spring Boot app. It runs on port 8080. Then the other one I've called Async. And this Spring Boot application actually contains a very simple uh, BPM and process definition. It runs on port 8090. So this is the port where it's running. So it's running its own process. So they are two independent processes. The important thing to note is they both use the same database. So if you can see, I have a Postgres database on this VM running on this port. And both the web app as well as the Ursync app use the same database. Let's look at what the process is which I have. Uh, you will see I have four process definitions, but they are actually all iterations of the same process where I improve it step by step. So I hope to show you the problems we face with the first one, and then we see how we solve them subsequently. What is this process? It's a very simple deployment process. So a business user starts deployment. Uh, we use an embedded. Uh, HTML form for this. Not sure if you can read it, but it's, there's a specific path which is specified there, async underscore deployment, and then the name of the artifact. Then uh, the task is submitted, and the next step is that an IT user comes and specifies the IT artifacts to be deployed. So it could be the Maven coordinates of the IT artifacts. It could be the Docker image ID, whatever you want. Again, this uses embedded forms using the same path here, uh, sorry, the same path here, async underscore deployment and the name of the HTML file. And thereafter, uh, there are just service tasks which run for performing deployment, analyzing the deployment, logging the deployment, and finally notifying the business user. So all these steps have been mocked. There is no integration here. It's just logging to the console, but that's enough for this demo. Uh, I'll get the reverse proxy part out of the way because I think the Java execution is, is more interesting. So just to see how, we, how the reverse proxy is configured, in my web app, I'm using Zool as my reverse proxy here. I hope it is legible. Uh, you can use anything else. You could probably front it by Apache, but this serves our purpose. And I specified a route which says that if there's any request which starts with async underscore deployment, please get those artifacts from something running on 8090 at this URL. And on 8090, we actually have our async application which is running. And it will map to uh, the static forms which are present there. So that's how it's going to get it. Uh, we will see that in action now. The other thing to note before I start with the demo is uh, I have also specified a couple of listeners here on the specify RT artifacts activity. There's a start execution listener and a create task listener. They don't do anything useful. They just log to the console. I just want to show you the problem which occurs here. That's why I have these here. So let's try and start an instance of this process. So this is the sync one deploy. And this, this particular drop-down list has come from the code here, choose deployment, which is running in the Ursync app. So we've seen that the Zool proxy is already working now and showing you the, uh, the content. So it has retrieved the content from the Ursync app. And it is being shown in the Kamunda web app. Now I can choose to I can choose any business component here. I say, for example, I'll choose the analytics component and I will say start. 
and boom, it fails. So it says, cannot resolve identifier UI task execution listener. And what is this UI task execution listener? If you see, this is the name of my delegate expression. You can't read it, but this is exactly the delegate expression which it is looking for. And what is more interesting is where this error has occurred. So I'm looking at the log of the web app, and I see that this error has occurred in the web app. This means this was a thread running in the web app which is trying to retrieve or execute this uh, listener. So why does this occur? Uh, I will blatantly refer to the Kamunda docs to show you how good they are, to show how exactly uh, an activity is executed. So all this is present in the Kamunda docs. So the thread executing the activity first executes a listener on the incoming sequence. Then it executes any start listeners. Then it executes the activity itself. Then any end listeners. And then any take listeners on the outgoing sequence. If this activity is a user task, it's a wait state because it needs input from the user. In that case, it will commit the transaction to the database, create an entry in the task list, or an instance of it in the task table, which is shown in the task list, and wait for the user input. If we apply this pattern here to understand why this problem has occurred, the form was submitted back to the Kamunda web app. The thread running in the Kamunda web app tried to execute listeners here on the incoming sequence flow. There were none. Then it tried to execute listeners, the start listeners here, and it couldn't find that class. And that's why this exception has occurred. So how do we resolve this problem? I've shown this in the second iteration, and the feature of Kamunda which we use is called asynchronous continuation. So it's this part here. You can specify either asynchronous before or asynchronous after. I've used asynchronous before. And how does this work? So all I've done is just stick this. There's no other code which has been written. Again, let's look at the documentation here. So when you say that you have asyn or when the thread executing encounters an activity which has asynchronous execution before, it does two things. One is, before executing any start listener, there's a, it's a transaction boundary. A transaction boundary means it is committed to the database. And the second thing is that an asynchronous continuation is always executed by the job executor. So it will then create an entry in the job table, which we saw in the presentation here. So it will do exactly this thing. It will create an entry in the job table, which is then picked up by the acquisition thread running in my async process, and it is executed here. So this is the only change I've done here, which means we should get past this problem now. So let's execute it and see what happens. I'll close this, start process, and I'll say sync to. In the first case, we ran across an exception right over here. And I hope now it will go through. So you see the process has started. If you look at the logs, uh, I've, this is the previous log, so I'll clear this. In async execution, you've seen that the two listeners have executed, the task execution listener and the, ex the task listener and the execution listener. And then this is a user task, so it stops over here and waits for the user, and it creates an entry in the task list, and now it's waiting for user input. So I should see an entry here, which is the case. Now the IT user comes and specifies the IT coordinates for this business artifact. Doesn't matter what I give, I'll just give any rubbish here. And I say submit. And then I hit another error here. It says unknown property in expression perform deployment. And if I look at uh, my log in my web app, again, in my web app, I see this exception over here in the web app. Uh, yeah, unknown property here, perform deployment, which means, again, the thread was running in the web app. Again, to follow why this happened, when the user submitted the form, the thread in the web app was running here, tried to execute listeners here, didn't find any, tried to execute listeners here, didn't find any, 
tried to execute the service task, boom, there was no Java class here. So that's why it failed. So the solution to that is, again, as you might guess, uh, have an asynchronous continuation. So I add an asynchronous before over here, so that at this point, uh, the thread encounters this, and it does, again, it's two things. One, it sees this is a transaction boundary, so it's going to commit to the database. And second, it will, again, create a job in the job table, which then the job acquisition thread running in my async process will pick up and execute. So with this change, we should get past this problem as well. Uh, this is my sync3 process. So let me try and run it. So I again pick up any business artifact I want. I say start. I should now see my task here. It's present over here. I claim it. Give some input which is required. And before I click on submit, I just want to show you here that in the async app, my listeners have already executed, which is good. And I, we want to see what it does after that. So I will click on complete now. And here you can see, I hope this is legible. Uh, So we can see that this is the logging of the perform deployment step. This is uh, this step. Then the next is analyze, then log, and finally notify users. So there is analyze, log, and notify user. So it's all there now. So the process is run through successfully, which is good. But there's one more improvement which we can do, and this touches upon the point made in your presentation yesterday. Uh, let us imagine that while uh, sending an email notification, the SMTP server is down, and there's an exception which we don't catch. What Kamunda does when there's an uncaught exception is it rolls back to the previous transaction boundary. In our case, the previous transaction boundary is where the async execution a continuation was specified over here. So it would roll back the tra transaction to just before any start listeners here, and it would again create an entry in the job table, which would mean that perform deployment would again take place, and analysis, and logging, which is probably not what we want, just because we couldn't send an email. So the last improvement which we do is, as you can imagine, I specify an asynchronous continuation before, before the notify uh, artifact as well, notify step as well. So that if something goes wrong here, it rolls back to the previous transaction boundary, which is this one. And then it will only try and send the notification again. It won't try and perform all these steps. Similarly, here in analyze deployment, I've also added an async before. For the same reason that in case something goes wrong here by logging or uh, while analyzing, maybe I don't know, disk space not there or whatever, it doesn't need to perform the deployment again because it will roll back to the previous transaction boundary, which is the asynchronous continuation here. So it would only uh, perform these steps again. And this is the last iteration of this improved process now, which is the deploy process. Uh, we should only see two more different log entries, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So here's the process. If you saw there was a slight lag in showing it in the task list, and there is a setting to address that as well, which I will go into if I have time. And I say complete. And here. So we see, again, the same things which we saw earlier, perform deployment. But in the middle, we see something else, job executor adding new exclusive. And this is because of the async execution which we added here. Uh, where is it? Yeah, here. 
Then we see analyze deployment and log deployment. And then we see another entry for the job executor. And that is because of the asynchronous execution which we added here. And finally is the notify user. So this is how we solved our problem of uh, running in separate VMs. Uh, there was no custom code written at all. It's all here. The one other thing which I would like to show you are these two parameters. So there is a property job execution deployment aware. This is what ensures that the job acquisition thread only picks up jobs meant for it. And for example, doesn't pick, pick up jobs meant for another process definition. And therefore, we have to specify the same setting in the web app as well, so that the web app doesn't pick up jobs uh, meant for the async process. Uh, then we see there are two parameters here. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the job acquisition thread, the one which pulls the job table here, this one, this waits until there are, I think, three jobs in the job table, if I'm not mistaken. If it doesn't find any, then it again uh, holds back and comes back after some time. And that time you can specify by this property. I have called it wait time in millis, but the documentation states exactly how it's called. So it will try again in a certain amount of time, but it will only do it for a certain amount of time. So that is specified by this upper bound, which means that if within five seconds it doesn't find three or more jobs, it will still pick up whatever jobs are there in the job table. The default value for this is, I think, 60 seconds. And I've set it to five seconds so that I don't have to wait for 60 seconds until I see a task appearing in my task list here. Because as we saw that, uh, that the, the boundary or the, the wait state is over here when the execution listeners are then executed. And then a job entry is created. So it would wait for one minute before showing me the entry. And I didn't want that. That's why I set it to five seconds. All this is uh, documented very well on the Kamunda website. I have added links to it in my presentation as well. And I think that was that for the live demo. Uh, let me see if there's anything else in the slide which I want to talk about. Questions? Before we go to questions, as, as I said, the source code which I've used is present at this GitHub link. And these are all the links to the Kamunda documentation which I used. And yeah, that is it before I Except questions again, thank you to Ingo who came over to our premises and validated our architecture and gave it Kamunda stamp of approval. And to Nico and Matos as well for teaching me Kamunda and making me able to present here. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>